abstraction. Abstraction represents one of our most fundamental human processes because it involves capturing something about an object that represents a key aspect or a key part of the object, a key piece of information that tells us something about the object, uh, its behavior, its structure, the way it appears, the way it sounds, the way that we might touch it, interact with it. So uh, abstraction ultimately will lead to modeling and thus is an extremely important concept. Abstract thinking can be found in just about all fields of study. I guess when we, when we talk about uh, abstraction, the first thing we want to figure out is how it's used commonly. That is, what's its dictionary definition? And after that, what we'll do is we'll look into abstraction in art and then in science. Let's start out with the Webster's de definition. Like a lot of words in English, the roots of these words are either from Latin or Greek. In this particular case, Latin abstractus, which means to pull, draw, or drag away. And so that is the essence of abstraction, is to pull or drag away. Also, we use the word abstraction in a common way when we talk about something that is difficult to understand. We say that's abstract, that's an abstract statement, meaning that it's not something that's very obvious. Maybe it's somewhat abstruse or arcane disassociated from an instance. So a lot of times if people talk conceptually about concepts and not about real world objects like coffee cups and bicycles, then you're talking abstractly. Abstraction is expressing a quality apart from an object and that pretty much goes with the idea of talking about concepts and not talking about instances or particulars. Let's look at art. First of all, there are two ways of looking at abstraction in art. The first deals with abstract painting or sculpture. In essence, we're talking about a genres or a genre of art. And the second way that abstraction is used within art is when we talk more about formal elements that make up all genres of art, any kind of art that we might find in a museum or on the web. So as a first step, we need to understand the word mimesis in art and how artists have basically progressed from the beginning of times from what they may call mimetic representations to other forts of other other parts of representation that is to represent represent the original subject in a completely different way so let's go ahead and start with mimesis what does mimesis mean well mimesis essentially refers to the idea that something looks like the subject or target that you're representing. So if I make a portrait of the Mona Lisa and the Mona Lisa actually looked the way that Leonardo da Vinci painted her, then that's an example of mimesis. Okay, another good example is the work by Vermeer. And uh, there's a whole bunch of different paintings on this particular site. Let's go ahead and take a look at this one. This one is called the Music Lesson. Now, the Music Lesson is pretty realistic and it's mimetic. That is that by looking at it, it actually represents visually the thing that was being done at the time, which may have been very artificial uh, for purposes of 
the the painters for the painter's purposes but in any case it's something that you can imagine the painter Vermeer painting on his easel and painting the scene which has actually happened and in that sense it's a very direct realistic representation and that's what the artists mean when they say mimetic art and so mimesis has been something that has been part of art for a long time in fact up to the latter parts of the 19th and 20th centuries it's been considered almost a de facto part of what it means to do art now one of the interesting things about Vermeer is that he used or he he is supposed to have used with some evidence being written up in some recent books a thing called a camera obscura to, to do his paintings and so in fact that makes this Vermeer's work even a better example of mimetic art because he used if he did in fact use a camera obscura he used a device which allowed him to in effect create a photographically realistic quality painting okay now if we proceed up to the 20th century we can find other representations which are not mimetic so some examples are for say from Mondrian we can take a look at say Broadway Boogie Woogie okay Broadway Boogie Woogie looks a bit like a Manhattan street perhaps in a, in a in a very abstract sense but we can see that this is not this is not example of mimetic art this is highly abstract uh, it's still a representation we are representing material that is in the real world we're just doing it in an extra incredibly abstract fashion so mimesis then is essentially crafting or creating a piece of art that looks like the thing that you're actually trying to represent and represent representation in a broader sense means that we're trying to abstract qualities away from the target to essentially draw away to remove information in some fashion from the target in order to show one side of the target or the subject this is a portrait of a painting called stag by a Dutch artist van der Leck who is part of the this steel movement the style movement and if you take a look at the leftmost image right here we see a picture of the stag and it looks fairly abstract as it is but there's a fair amount of detail in this picture now if we continue over to this one right here we see that we've removed some of the dimensions and the detail and some of the shape that we find in this leftmost image over here I mean this has some scratches it has some lines which are fairly complicated compared with this which is more simplistic and represents a kind of contour or simple shape so this is more abstract than this and we can actually continue this abstraction for van der Leck, and we can proceed over here and obtain this drawing which is an abstraction of that one and basically the the best way to to see that is to back up a little bit and to take a look at this drawing and this drawing next to one another and we can see that uh, it's kind of difficult to see that this is actually a stag when compared with that however if you can put these pieces together in your mind or your mind's eye rather you can kind of visualize the stag here and this over here uh, is even more abstract than this one right here so we have this procedure of going from left to right of essentially increasing abstraction from left to right of uh, these four pictures by van der Leck. this is a set of paintings by an artist 
named Theo van Dusburg, who was the originator or the founding member of the style movement in the Netherlands. And the first thing we kind of take a look at right over here is this photograph. Okay, so we've got a photograph of a woman. And then the next thing over here, we have something that is much more impressionistic, kind of a the kind of thing that you might find one of the impressionist painting and so we can see this is a somewhat of an abstraction of the photograph over here on the left and if we proceed further over here to the right we find something that's even more abstract than what you found over on the left hand side and what's over here this looks a cubist or something of of, of that of that elk and so as we proceed from left to right, we find that we abstract away certain qualitative attributes of the painting. So beginning with the photograph to this first painting and to this second painting. And then if we go over here to the far hand, uh, the right hand side over here, we see something that is extremely abstract, uh, almost to the point where you can perhaps not recognize that there's a woman's torso, head, neck, and so forth. We can't really see that there's a portrait here necessarily unless we were told so beforehand. And if you continued going going down here you see things which are far more abstract. Over here uh, and here and here we see things which are kind of roughly painted and then over on the right hand side over here you find something that is very clean and very abstract, very well-defined lines, almost essentially as if, as if they were done by using a ruler. This painting is by Piet Mondrian. It's called Tableau II, painted in 1922, oil on canvas, uh, 21 and 7 eighths by 21 and 1 eighth inches. It's part of the Guggenheim Museum. Piet Mondrian was a Dutch artist of the style movement, and his work basically started out being very naturalistic, somewhat realistic in terms of the, the figures that he represented in his paintings. For instance, if you take a look at the 1908 painting, the mill in sunlight, we get something that looks fairly realistic. I mean, it looks kind of like a windmill, kind of like what you might expect a windmill to look like, even though there's some abstraction there. However, if we go back and we proceed up to the 1911 painting Gray Tree, we see something that is a little bit more abstract and still represents a tree as far as we were able to, do, uh, to discern. But then as we move on in time in Mondrian's life and his evolution into abstract painting, we get to say 1920, composition A, composition with black, red, gray, yellow, and blue. And so if we take a look at this, this represents pretty much the kind of painting that he did after 1920 and represents a kind of highly abstract geometrical style that he has that has come to be associated with his name. Concrete art was made as a response to some of the early forms of abstraction where essentially with concrete art there is no subject or target you just create the art and it doesn't actually represent anything. An uh, example of this is with the style, the genre, or movement in art called minimalism. And we can look at a lot of different types of minimalism on the web, but we'll look at uh, some of Frank Stella's work. So for instance, if we take a look, uh, let's go ahead and large image. So we can take a closer look at his at Stella's work, but just an example of what might be called uh, minimalist art. It really, it's a form of abstraction, but it 
is an abstraction in the sense that there isn't a source and a target. There's just a painting of nothing in particular. And uh, what the viewer makes of that is what makes the art interesting. And so this isn't the kind of abstraction that is useful in modeling, but it still makes for a very interesting piece of art. The next thing we look at is art in terms of its formal elements. If you talk about what it means to be abstract or abstraction in art, uh, this is something that if you don't look at a specific movement like abstract expressionism or abstract art or modern art, you have to look to, to some more recent, some of the more recent art literature on the use of abstraction and what that entails in terms of theory. And different artists have come up with different qualities that represent what it means to abstract away something from a subject. For instance, we might abstract away a line, linear elements, or form, shape, and mass, pattern, space, proportion, scale, and perspective. These, in a way, are scientifically motivated elements or qualities of any piece of art. You can look for these individual qualities within any piece of art that you might see in a museum. And so this is probably a more recent version of what it means to be abstract in art. Uh, abstraction in art isn't necessarily just the movement call abstract art. It's the, it's the actual process or procedure of abstracting away something. And so you might even call these types of models of visual models. You might have a linear visual model and essentially that would be a piece of art that had a lot of lines in it and that focused on lines as basically the linear abstraction of some particular target like a horse for instance. Form, shape, and mass have their own individual meanings and we won't go into these here, but authors such as Arnheim covers these in more depth. Uh, Arnheim has a book on art and visual perception that adds to that list that we found back here in, in Hale's book. And he includes uh, qualities such as balance, growth, light, color, movement, and dynamics. Now, Things like dynamics don't mean the same thing as they do in physics. And movement is especially not the same thing in physics, also, although movement essentially is virtual movement. It's the idea that you might have movement or a suggested movement within a piece, something that looks like it's going to move or could move in a, a certain direction or has the potential to move. So it's this potential or virtuality that identifies movement. And growth is, is also counterintuitive that the person listening to this might think, well, growth has to do with the dynamics of, say, biological systems or, you know, fract they might imagine fractal growth and this kind of thing. But what Arnheim means by growth here is the, the relation of, of artistic practice to development in humans, especially how children model and how they do art. Well, let's move from art to science, uh, but by studying art, I think, though, we do get a foundation for what abstraction is, and in science, it's really not that different. It's, ex it's virtually the same thing. In science, since science representation in science is founded upon mathematics. We look to mathematics as essentially kind of the ultimate abstraction. We use mathematics as a way of abstracting things about the world and we generally put these things on paper or more recently we put them on the computer screen. 
And so in terms of for science and uh, in computer science, abstraction plays a major role and is very much tied to mathematical underpinnings and mathematical foundation. Three things in computer science that are have uh, strong concepts or tones of abstraction are program hierarchy, hierarchy within computer programs, concepts of data hiding and encapsulation, and the object-oriented paradigm and aggregation and generalization trees for that. Okay, let's talk about um, program hierarchy, encapsulation, object orientation, see how this relates to abstraction. Uh, first of all, if we we're talking about program hierarchy, all programs allow for hierarchy. Uh, in the old Fortran days, you would have subroutines. And those subroutines could contain call to, calls to other subroutines. And ultimately, this achieves a kind of a tree with a root and then branches from the root that can have further branches and so on and so forth until you obtain the leaf, the leaf nodes of the tree, which are subroutines that contain no other subroutines. I mean, so, so an ex a simple example then would be if we were going to go ahead and drive to the grocery store, we might just uh, draw a tree like this. We'd say um, going to store, okay, and that's our root node. And then we would go ahead and say, well, going to the store requires four different things, okay, and we would go ahead then and put those four arcs to designate those four things. We'd say in order to go to the store, the first thing is we need to leave the driveway, okay, so we'd say leave driveway and then we might say leave the neighborhood so I'd say leave neighborhood and after doing that I need to drive the connecting roads which lead me to the grocery store so I'll say um, just I'll say connecting roads and the last thing I need to do is I need to park the car at the, at the grocery store itself. So I'll just say the last thing I want to do is park the car. And so we have four different things. And uh, each thing, of course, has e each, each subroutine or each procedure, each process will have sub-processes. So leaving the neighborhood might involve two separate things. Leaving the neighborhood might involve first uh, traveling north on 3rd Street. So I'd say travel north on 3rd. Okay, but then it also next means that I need to travel west on Main. So I'd say travel west on Main. All right, so this gives an example of a program whose goal is to get you from your house to the grocery store. And all programs are of this fashion. They can be drawn in terms of trees with individual nodes, some of which are going to be leaf nodes, like this is a leaf node, this is a leaf node, these two are leaf nodes, but you'll also have internal nodes to the tree. So, for instance, this right here is going to be an internal node. And, of course, this is a special kind of internal node, which we're going to call the root node of the tree. So this is an example. Now, how does this relate to abstraction? Well, the first thing to, to see is that the topmost levels, the internal nodes of the tree, really represent abstractions of those pieces of the tree that are underneath that. So for instance, going to the store is a high level of abstraction. That if I were to say, I'm going to the store, that really I'm getting away from having to go into the 
dreaded detail of having to specify all this other stuff down here. Okay. Instead, I just say, well, instead of all this, I say, I'm just going to go to the store. And uh, so this is a, a highest level of abstraction. And then as we proceed to go into the lower levels, we go into lower abstraction levels, more concrete levels, more levels of detail. So this is our highest abstraction level right here. This is our next most highest. And this is our lowest for this particular example. And you can imagine taking something like going to the grocery store and expanding it into uh, hundreds of nodes. But this at least gives you the, ex the idea of how a typical software program will provide for different levels of abstraction in terms of process, in terms of procedure, what you're going to end up doing. And so abstraction certainly plays a role there. Now if we take a look at something like uh, encapsulation, this has long been something of interest within computer science and programming. And uh, we, can, we can look at, along with the idea of going to the grocery store, let's take a look at the kitchen. Okay. Now these things that I'm picking, these domains that I'm picking are, are kind of uh, common domains and that in fact if you were to build a program it may not be to go to the grocery store, it may not be to define the innards of a kitchen, but the kinds of things you would be creating would be very similar. You would be defining hierarchical processes over here and you would also be defining encapsulated data structures. So the term struct which is found in the language C, for instance, provides for a good example of basic encapsulation. And so if we've got a kitchen, we know the kitchen might be composed of appliances, a kitchen counter, a floor, and say a light. Real kitchens are going to be more complicated than this, but this serves our purposes. As we have in process abstraction, we have abstraction that is more of a container type abstraction. Here, we say that, well, appliances, there are many appliances. There may be a microwave oven, so just say MW. There may be a regular oven, a convection oven. That's another example of appliance. Uh, we might have a refrigerator, which I'll just shorten to fridge right here. Okay, so these are some appliances that we have. And uh, you could also, of course, say that the oven has its own properties, that the refrigerator has its own properties. It has shelves. It's got a freezer section. It's got a regular section. And so there are hierarchies there. And so what does this have to say with abs about abstraction? Again, it's uh, relating to, it all comes back to the mathematical discrete structure called the tree. And the, the, the top root node of the tree is the most abstract thing in that representation. And as we move down to the leaves gradually, we end up with less abstract things. So the kitchen is the most abstract. If I say, I have a kitchen, that means that I don't have to say, oh, I have appliances, I've got a counter, I've got a floor, and I've got a light. I just say I've got a kitchen, and this form of linguistic or communicative economy makes it easy for me to abstract away that I've got all these things in my daily conversation, thus making the conversation more efficient and more economic. About 30 years ago, with the advent of a language called Simula, which was used mainly for discrete event simulation, we got the idea of object-oriented methodology and design. And this is something that has been quite common in computer science literature and in software engineering methodologies. And it's kind of taken off. It represents, for instance, 
the philosophical basis for languages such as C++ and Java, which are both object-oriented, quote-unquote. Now, in object-oriented design, there are two kinds of hierarchies which are very important, and both of them have connections to abstraction because both of them involve, again, trees. So let's go ahead and take a look at aggregation, and we're going to go ahead and use our kitchen example. Aggregation in the kitchen example would be very much the same in the object-oriented design with one slight difference, okay, which is important. And so let's go ahead and take a look at the refrigerator. We would go ahead and we would say, I have a refrigerator and the refrigerator contains or encapsulates two different components. It has a regular component or regular compartment and it also has a freezer compartment. Okay, and we can break this down, of course, any way you like. We could say that both the regular and the freezer section have shelving, which they do. The freezer section may have an ice cube maker, so let's just go ahead and do that. We'll say the freezer section has an ice cube maker, but we'll also say that the freezer section contains shelving, and we'll just group that into one aggregate concept. So let's make it clear what exactly we're saying here. We're saying that there's a refrigerator, fridge, it contains or aggregates a regular, com a regular compartment and a freezer compartment. And perhaps just to make sure that uh, we'll say compartment just so that we know what we're talking about. And that the freezer compartment contains or aggregates ice cube maker and shelving. Now the thing, the only thing that makes this different than what we talked about before is that each of these individual nodes within the aggregation hierarchy is what's called a class in object-oriented design. And a class can be thought of in many different ways. One, one way to think of it is as kind of a set and that is that the fridge class represents the set of all fridges and the regular component class represents the set of all regular components. In other words, this fridge is not a particular fridge. It's not your fridge that's in your apartment or your house. It's the set of all fridges. And that if, in fact, you want to create an individual fridge within the object-oriented design approach using C++ or Java, you would go ahead and have to create this as a class and then instantiate a specific fridge using this class. So then what the aggregation hierarchy does within object-oriented design is it says that all fridges contain regular components and freezer components and all freezer components contain ice cube makers and shelving. Now how many they contain and whether they contain zero, one, two, or more are represented by special no specialized notations that you find in different design and analysis tools. For instance, in the unified modeling language there are diagrammatic and iconic representations that take you a little bit further than where I have in terms of representing what aggregation and what generalization mean. But if we look at abstraction, it fits perfectly into the mathematical tree pattern that we saw last time. This is the most abstract thing or concept. And that abstract concept has subconcepts which are less abstract down at this level. Now, if we go ahead and then take a look at generalization, generalization is a slightly different thing. We might say in the kitchen, we have appliances, and I'll just say appliance there. And the oven is a type of appliance, and the fridge is a type of appliance. 
Now, the oven might be different types of ovens. So we might go ahead then and say, all right, the there can might be convection oven and a microwave oven. So the relation is quite different in the generalization tree than it was over here. The relations that are designated by these arced arrows throughout all of these drawings, here the relations are contains or aggregates. So fridge contains this, fridge contains that, freezer contains this. Over here, you're talking about a type or categorization hierarchy. Often in object-oriented design, they call this a class hierarchy or even an inheritance hierarchy. As in biological metaphor and evolutionary biology, we consider that inheritance works as follows, that if you have an appliance, that oven as a kind of appliance inherits attributes and methods from appliance. Uh, I'll go ahead and make a sidebar on attributes and methods. Attributes are considered to be variables that are encapsulated within the class or the resulting object created from the class. And methods are procedures, routines as they were previously known, but they are attached to classes and to therefore to the objects that are created from the classes. So then what we have in terms of inheritance is we have a kind of a downward flow. This would be called say a base class right here. And so this would this would be kind of a base and then this class would be called a derived class of appliance. And of course this base and this derived can be positioned anywhere on the tree with base being above derived and the idea is that uh, the, the oven class derives content it derives attributes and methods from appliance so you get this downward motion for inheritance that the lower parts of the tree the leaves of the tree essentially inherit from the internal nodes which are higher now in terms of abstraction it's again the same thing. Appliance is more abstract than oven. Appliance is more abstract than fridge. Because appliance is at the root of the tree, which is always more abstract, just like it was over here. As a tool for getting a handle on abstraction, the, the age-old discipline of mathematics is probably one of the best set of tools that and, and set of archival knowledge that we can bring to bear to understand the nature of abstraction in order to to have the most precise methods for describing it. And so just about everything you look at in a mathematical te in a math mathematics textbook is essentially a description of abstraction of other things. So for instance the concept of number is an abstraction because it's an abstraction of the number of sheep, the number of bushels of grain, the number of toy trains, the number of basketballs. It doesn't matter to some extent what they are as far as abstraction is concerned when we talk about number. Set is the same thing. A set basically comes from algebra and we know that we can have a set of items and we don't really care what those items are again for the purposes of abstraction we just have a set of things and we can represent that set and the idea of set and the operations that go with it the fact that there are elements of a set that sets can be intersected that can, there could be a union these are useful things to be able to do to think abstractly about individual cases Likewise, an equation is a, is a fairly abstract thing because it abstracts away what quantities or uh, what, what particular scales are being used. One thing to be noted with all of these things is 
there's a difference between the abstraction, there's a slight difference between the abstraction that we talked about in art and the abstraction that we have in mathematics. Abstraction in mathematics does not speak to the representation the visual model associated with number, the visual model associated with set, that is how we view them, or the visual model associated with equation. I might represent an equation with houses, dragons, stones, and flowing water. And if I do so in a way that is uh, aesthetically pleasing and in a way that people or a group of people can understand the equation, then mathematics doesn't really care. Mathematics is not about making minimalist visual models. It's about making connections among a large variety of things in order to abstract away features. Not visual features, but other features. As a historical footnote to this, if we look at the history of language and the history of mathematics, we go back to ancient Sumeria where they used a variety of different tokens. And these were made of clay, fired in clay, and they represented the number of amount of grain, perhaps the amount of bread, the amount of uh, sheep or goats or other animals that might be used for exchange and sold at market. And these things would be encoded, or I'm sorry, these things would first be put, be put in a, an en a clay envelope and stored. Here are the tokens that are shown here. And then the clay envelope ultimately evolved into cuneiform, which was placed outside, which replaced the individual tokens that were over here on the left. So this procedure from individual tokens over to cuneiform shows us a kind of interesting and remarkable rep change in representation. Now originally uh, the Babylonians went ahead and they represented numbers. They didn't have the concept of number. They actually went ahead and say if this was a jar of oil of olive oil, let's say, that they, they would fire up a clay token and say, okay, that represents the, uh, the jar of olive oil. If they had five jars, then they'd fire five clay tokens. Uh, so the concept of number was not there. Now, there was nothing really stopping them from saying, hey, wait a minute, maybe I can represent the, what we would call today the number five for five, uh, for five olive jars why not just come up with a clay token that represents five? And that's not something that, uh, that they did. Instead, over a number of centuries and millennia, we, we kind of arrive at cuneiform. All right, now let's, uh, let's, let's talk about modeling for a second and how that relates to abstraction. Clearly, modeling uses abstraction in a very serious way. Models are in fact abstractions. So when we talked about art, we were talking about a kind of abstraction where one was focused on visual attributes. One is abstracting away visual content. And so we referred to art as being a type of visual model. In science and engineering, we have many other kinds of models. Uh, we use scale models. Scale models are used in architecture. They're used in creating toys. And in fact, they're used by professionals in creating, say, scale models of submarines and scale models of ships and trains and aircraft. It allows you to, to provide accessibility to an object to create a scale model. So what is scale model abstracting? Well, a scale model is essentially abstracting away the absolute size of the original object. You're abstracting that away because for purposes of accessibility. If we take a look then at something like information modeling, you're abstracting away everything except the information concepts 
that you're trying to represent. So for instance, a semantic network is a good example of an information model. Uh, an entity relationship diagram is an example of an information model. And there are many other examples and groups of different sorts create their own information models. For geometry, we would create a model that represents the internal structure of a thing. And this is most often done today with something we call scene graphs. And a scene graph represents the structure, the geometric connective structure of a 2D or 3D scene. And so it's abstracting away everything except that. If you were to basically take a look at a target object like the Mona Lisa, well, the artist would say, I've got a model of the Mona Lisa and produce a painting. The scale modeler would say, I have a model of the Mona Lisa and they'd show you some perhaps, and we're talking again about the original Mona Lisa, assuming that the, we got a real person here. They would show you perhaps a small sculpture of the Mona Lisa sitting down. The information model might represent in graph or network form things, that, some important pieces of information about the Mona Lisa, her color of their hair, where, where she, uh, what kinds of things she did during the day, and so forth. Geometry then, a geometry model for the Mona Lisa would represent perhaps the, uh, the kinematic linkage of her body, her, essentially her geometry and it would say, uh, which, which would of course be very similar to or identical with the, the rest of the human population. So these kinds of models then abstract away everything except the thing that they're trying to focus on. In the original Latin word abstractus, meaning to draw or pull away, that's exactly what's happening with all of these kinds of models. You're pulling away a specific slice or perspective or view on the original Mona Lisa. S same with dynamics. At dynamics we might be representing some movement or some activity associated with a Mona Lisa. You know, perhaps uh, to be to be funny, maybe Mona Lisa does jumping jacks every morning. And so you might want to create a model that describes how she does that. And that's what dynamic models are about, about describing that kind of thing. So all of these models are created with physical matter, material things that are connected together in a way to show some perspective of the Mona Lisa, a perspective that goes far beyond the word perspective in art, where you talk about perspective projection. Uh, although the idea is, is similar, that you basically can never get to the real Mona Lisa. The real Mona Lisa is 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 some is somebody that that we can never represent completely in any one rep, in any one presentation. Instead, we must create multiple models of her to understand her. We must create models of all of these types plus many more because that is our human situation we really can't go any further than that those are our only options to create models in a way to better understand the Mona Lisa so let's summarize uh, what what we've learned in the abstraction discussion the first is the definition of abstraction we want to, to and, mod, and how it relates to modeling. Modeling is to abstract away an aspect of a target phenomenon. And you can think of the phenomenon as being an object or a set of objects or a scene. Abstraction, we have seen, does involve a reduction in information. And we saw that very much so with the artistic examples, for example, where as you went from a portrait or a photograph of a sitting woman to something that was more abstract, you, you it, it's, it's not so much that you reduce material, uh, you reduce the, the pigment, the oil paint on the canvas. What you did instead was you took some aspect, you filtered the original photograph, 
and you took those aspects and just focused on those aspects for instance the linear contour uh, of the stag from Vanderleck okay so there is a very much a reduction in information in the Shannon Weaver sense of information if we consider information for instance as representing a string of bits then this is what we have is we have fewer bits representing the more abstract thing and we have more bits representing um, the least abstract more complex thing we also saw from some of the examples in computer science that the concept of a tree underlied what was going on there in terms of abstraction so you have a many to one when you have a many to one mapping then you have a situation where the many represents the least abstract things and the one represents the more abstract thing and these things of information reduction and many to one mapping often shown in the form of a tree both are related to the definition of abstracting away or pulling away pieces of a pulling away uh, views or perspectives of, of an object there are some formal tools that we briefly discussed for abstraction and these, abs these tools are in the domain of mathematics in algebra we have uh, techniques such as homomorphism and isomorphism and these are ways of creating the many to one mapping and so these tools turn out to be very useful along with set theory and algebra algebraic modes and definitions in general to create a a way to do abstraction a kind of a a cookbook method for helping us to create abstract objects also um, with the Shannon Weaver information idea this also provides a concrete method for doing abstraction is that you just reduce the number of bits first of all you come up with a representation for something in terms of multiple bits where each bit occupies a certain position and then the reduction provides you with with the more abstract thing subtraction so turns out to be extremely popular extremely common it's it's part of what makes us human many would say it's part of our our evolution to where we are today in terms of uh, humans being at the top of the chain having tremendous progress uh, especially over the last 500 years in terms of science and engineering what was been produced is a lot of that is basically due to our use of abstraction and how powerful it is and to some extent how it separates us from other animals